Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, have you heard the song, Bound for Glory? Um, It's a a catchy song about a train headed for glory, for paradise. Well, in our gospel lesson, Jesus essentially says that he is bound for glory. Uh, But it's not exactly the glory that the Palm Sunday crowd expects as they lay their palms before him. Our verses for today come immediately after the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday with those crowds singing Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, if you recall, John has a penchant for recording conversations that help us to understand at a deeper level what is really going on. However, John also really likes to make us think So this conversation, like many in John, is a bit of a puzzle. It starts off as some Greeks who come up to Philip at the feast. Perhaps they've come to Philip because he was from the more uh, racially diverse or ethnically diverse Galilee, and they say, we want to see Jesus. Well, this seems like a pretty good thing, right? And, And Philip and Andrew approach Jesus with this request. And John's already clued us in that Jesus has not come just for the sheep of Israel, but for sheep that were not of this pasture as well. And Jesus has had conversations with uh, Samaritans and sinners along the way. John often refers to Jesus' arguments with the Jews, which is one more way in which John is pointing out that the salvation is not just for the Jews, but that God's own did not receive him. So we're kind of expecting Jesus to be sympathetic to this request. However, it's kind of like he's ignoring it, it seems like. He starts talking about his appointed time coming and spouts off about sprouts and seeds. Philip and Andrew had to go back and probably mutter some lame excuse about why Jesus wasn't going to see them. And meanwhile, we're left wondering, does Jesus care about the Greeks? It seems like Jesus is being distant or rude or uncaring. Well, John gives us the the puzzle pieces to help us answer this question. The first puzzle piece John gives us is that the Greeks come to Jesus at the feast. Now, some Jewish holidays, such as Passover, are not just one day long. They are week-long affairs at some times, and Passover was a week long, and this takes place on Palm Sunday, but by talking about how this takes place at the feast, John's kind of cluing us on to think about this more than just this day, but think about the whole feast, which will be going on for another week. And Jesus' answer will really not be complete to the Greeks until the feast and his passion are over. John, uh, the next piece of the puzzle is the sign of the seeds. Now, I suspect that no one there understood what Jesus was talking about when he said it. Certainly not fully understanding about the resurrection. Now, this may very well have been, I suspect, one of those tidbits or conversations, perhaps even the rest of the disciples kind of forgot about, but had gotten stuck in John's brain and he, as he was trying to figure out what in the world Jesus was trying to say and why he wasn't speaking directly to these people who had wanted to come see him. Well, in chapter 10, Jesus had said, I referenced this earlier, Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. All, All the histories and commentaries that I've come across make it sound like The expectation, the general expectation in the ancient world was that most people were fiercely loyal to whoever they identified as their clan or people. Those who were outsiders of your group were regarded warily or perhaps even with suspicion or hostility. The tense relationships that we read about between the Gentiles and the Jews is a prime example, but far from the only one in the ancient world. Even today, it's pretty easy to view those who are different as outsiders or or maybe not our concern. It's easy to think that, for instance, a problem that someone else has, such as uh, racism in some areas, maybe that's just a a black problem 
or a problem for those who are of Asian descent, but not really our concern. However, events like the, the tragic ones that took place in Atlanta are, if nothing else, an opportunity for us uh, to listen and to care for others as, since we have the opportunity to do so. And a big part of the New Testament is wrestling with diversity issues inside the church. In Galatians chapter 3, um, Paul explains how all Israel um, cannot rely on being Jewish or following the Torah law or being good, we might say, because all are under the curse of the law and can only be saved through Jesus. The, the biblical point is pretty simple. We're all sinners, and yet we are all saved by God's grace because of Jesus who died to redeem all who repent and trust in him. However, on the other hand, you can't really just sort of manufacture this inclusivity on your own. I think sometimes we see problems and we'd like them just to be solved or just to make them get better. Uh, but you can't just make people come together. Something has to bring them together. It took the cross and the gospel of Jesus to bring Gentiles and Jews together in the New Testament. And I still think the best way to bring people together is through the cross and the gifts of faith, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. Well, and after all, that is what Jesus is talking about. He doesn't just invite the Greeks to join him in an imagined or um, fake friendliness, you might say. No, Jesus is going to make something new, it, and, and it can't be rushed or forced. Um, that's why Jesus uses and talks about the sign of the seed to answer the Greeks. They want to come see him, but his answer is not just yet. And now, the vast majority of Jesus' interactions were with Jews and not with Gentiles. There are certainly some notable exceptions, and there are informative exceptions as well, such as the centurion or the Syrophoenician woman or the Samaritan woman at the well. However, by and large, Jesus kept it mostly local. So why didn't Jesus go to Rome or Africa or the Far East? Because you can't skip the cross. Take him or leave him, but Jesus' words about the seed say as much. Unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And then he goes on to say, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. In other words, talk is cheap. And until Jesus has made a new people through his death and resurrection, through his glorification, we might say, they probably were not going to come together superficially. Jesus is or was only a single seed, or at best the savior of a single nation. Yet Jesus' death uh, was the beginning of the spreading of the gospel. Uh, the whole world would and now does pretty much eventually see Jesus lifted up on the cross. All the world would together be condemned, uh, no, all the world would condemn Jesus and be complicit in Jesus' death. It wasn't just one, but the Roman authorities as well as Greeks or Jews and Gentiles alike. However, through baptism into Jesus' death, now the whole world would be put to death and raised with Christ in the resurrection. In fact, as we talk about being bound for glory, you and I, the whole church, we are bound up with Christ. By binding all men together in the, as complicit in, and guilty in the death of Christ, not just Jews but Gentiles, the whole world really is guilty of rejecting the Lord. In the cross, all of humanity was bound up and condemned by the law. But, but yet, our Lord did this so that he could also bind all of humanity to him through the death of Jesus. The law ties us up, and we're all condemned by the law, as Paul likes to say, um, for our, it was our sinfulness and our rejection of the Lord that put him there. And yet it was the love of our Lord that kept him upon the cross. And since, we might say it this way, since Jesus got tied up 
in our condemnation. He got tied up with our sin and bound to our death. We are invited to get stuck to Him as we are resurrected as well. Um, The last piece of the puzzle is Jesus' hour when he is lifted up for all to see. Jesus says that his time has come to be glorified, to be raised up. But what will the manner of his raising up or being lifted up be? Just as he did earlier in this conversation with Nicodemus about new birth and the kingdom of God, Jesus once again brings up the, the perhaps most important sign, the serpent lifted up in the wilderness. Now, Jesus says, is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus was lifted up on the cross so that all people, so that he could draw all people to himself. Jesus is the seed planted in the grave. Now, had God rescued Jesus from the cross, it would simply have been the rescue or vindication of one man, Jesus himself. But the plan was not just that. The plan was to wait for Jesus to be condemned and killed and to bear the sin and condemnation not just of uh, of the entire world so that he could forgive the entire world of its sins and redeem us. And so, as we come to Passion Week, don't turn away from the grisly sight of the cross. Rather, turn towards Jesus. Turn towards your Savior and His love for you, shown to you, lifted up. Though this world and its cruelty, your sin and its darkness, they have now been taken off of your shoulders and bound to your Savior upon the cross. While it looked like Jesus had been bound up and tied to sin, though that's not really what had happened. No, rather, Jesus bound up our sin to himself. Jesus put sin in a chokehold, and he nailed sin to himself, and he embraced death and refused to let go of sin until he had been buried. Jesus was buried, we're told, by Joseph of Arimathea, by Nicodemus, but it was Jesus who buried sin, death, and the devil. It was Jesus who bound the prince of darkness and cast him out from this world. And then when he left the tomb, Jesus left sin and the devil and death defeated and behind him. He left sin and condemnation behind, but you know what he didn't leave behind? You and me. And so now we too are bound to Jesus, bound up in his glory upon the cross, and bound up in the glory of his resurrection and ascension. In Jesus' name, amen.